Hello and welcome. This is a very special day and a very special week as we celebrate 25 years of CNBC TV 18. Uh, joining me now is someone who's been with us through these last 25 years. Christopher Wood absolutely need, needs no introduction. He was a journalist in an earlier life. Uh, he's a strategist. He's a global equity strategist, and he's also, I dare say, a rock star strategist. Someone who actually says it as he sees it, and he doesn't mince words. Chris, it's great to have you with us here. Great to see you, Prashad. I'm honored to be on that, this, doing this anniversary for CNBC after 25 years, and I've much enjoyed my interaction with the channel during this period, monitoring India's um, course, direction of travel. And it's culminated this year with, a, I have to say, uh, an amazingly bullish crescendo. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, Chris. Uh, you know, and, and I think this is such a great time to speak with you because a lot of questions here in India about what the, the U.S. elections and the outcome really means uh, for emerging markets and India specifically. So let me put that to you straight up and then we can, we, we can follow up on some of these individual points. What do you make of it, Chris? Well, personally, I don't think for India per se, it makes a huge difference. Obviously, for the world, it makes an enormous difference. But for India, I still think India is on track for 6 to 8% real GDP growth, 10 to 12% nominal GDP growth <clears throat> under the current, um, um, you know, in the next five years of, of, of the, the forthcoming Trump administration. <clears throat> but in the near term, it has the election of Donald Trump has created a negative headwind for emerging markets because it's reactivated a strong dollar. I'm not surprised to see that. My base case was that if Donald Trump won the election, most particularly in a convincing fashion, the likely initial market outcome would be a, a rising U.S. stock market, a rising U.S. dollar, and a sell-off in the Treasury bond market, which is what's happened. So to that extent, it's made it harder for, it's, it's reduced the room for maneuver for Asian central banks, emerging central banks to cut rates. But the Indian equity story is not predicated on the RBI about to cut, do a lot of rate cuts. So I don't think it's a really a big negative for India per se. Mm. Uh, in the US, I mean, the core interplay, Chris, seems to be a stock market and an economy which is picking up pace, if anything, and a central bank which is inclined to keep cutting. I mean, if Mr. Trump has its way, interest rates would be far lower. In any case, I mean, the guidance is that rates will go down quite a bit. I mean, that is a powerful combination for the largest equity market, largest economy in the world. Do you think money will keep going into U.S. assets into 2025 as well? Well, it's likely that U.S. equities <clears throat> remain well bid going into the inauguration because Trump's um, administration promises first. The key positive is extension of the corporate tax cuts. The second big positive equity investors are looking at is the expectation there's going to be aggressive deregulation policies. That's why you've seen a big rally in the financial stocks. And there's also hope that energy prices will decline, most particularly as the expectation is that uh, President, um, Donald Trump's going to move quickly to try and address this uh, Ukraine issue because he's made pretty clear he doesn't want to keep funding it. So all these are sort of near-term equity positive. In the medium term, though, which I would define as, you know, um, getting into the middle of the middle to the second half of 2025, the media term issue is what happens to the bond market, because rising bond deals in the U.S. do have the potential at least to derail equities at some point. The other issue for the U.S. stock market is not a macro issue, it's a bottom-up issue, but it's very important because the, Indian, the U.S. stock market is dominated by these big U.S. tech stocks. And the risk for, the, for these stocks is at some point the market starts to question the amount of money they are spending investing in AI because that is, that is going to cut back their free cash flow generation. Uh, no, absolutely. And uh, we will have to track uh, these events. Uh, 
So, so let's just finish the U.S. Uh, points, and we'll come to India in just a bit, Trace, uh, in some more detail. So, you know, you said a few things. Let me, let me uh, first ask you. You wrote in one of your earlier reports when the election was still uh, sort of, uh, you know, before the elections, actually, that uh, Mr. Trump, if elected, will end, you know, some conflicts, maybe at least one of the two big conflicts. Do you still believe that? Well, if you, uh, if you like Trump or loathe him, I think we have to admit he has a track record of trying to do what he says he's going to do. So basically, he's been pretty clear that he wants to end the Ukraine conflict. So I think we should assume that he will try and do something to address this issue pretty quickly. He's already had a telephone call uh, with the Ukrainian leader. He's been describing the Ukrainian leader as the best salesman in the world. So that suggests he's focusing on the amount of money the U.S. is sending to Ukraine. So I think he will be trying to end this conflict. But in the Middle East, I think the situation is much less clear. Uh, one of the things you have, uh, and we've spoken about this as well, you said, Mr. Trump has said his, his policy as far as energy is concerned is drill, baby, drill. Uh, should we expect sustained lower oil prices from where we are. I, I, although I have to say, it's not as if oil prices have shot up despite, uh, you know, some of the highest levels of conflicts over the last couple of years. Right. So basically, oil has been in this trading range of 70 to $90. And so the base case is we stay in that range. But there is a risk, there is a potential positive for the market, so we go below that range. Uh, the one thing about the drill baby drill is the question is, uh, geologically, I've, been, I've heard arguments in recent years that a lot of the shale energy has peaked So, in terms of production. So it's not clear to me the production will rise quite as much as uh, Donald Trump has been highlighting. But clearly, there's going to be a very different uh, policy as regards energy. And that's why not only why the energy stocks have got a bid, but it's also why the uh, refining stocks have been, have been hit. But basically, I think the market's most focused, the pod most, what's really driving this U.S. stock market higher is the expectation of tax cuts extended and very, uh, very aggressive pro-deregulation policies. But, you know, you have to remember Trump's policies, many of them are inflationary uh, in terms of uh, moving tariffs. If he really announces these big tariff increases, that's inflationary. If he really... Uh, throws out illegal immigration and cuts down on immigration, that's inflationary. Moving, yeah, moving production to America is inflationary. So there's a lot of inflationary headwinds, which is why my structural view on Treasury bonds remains bearish. I've been of the view that Treasury bonds have entered a bear market since the Fed printed all that money in the spring of 2020. So base case, I'm expecting Treasury bonds at some point to go of through 5% on the 10-year and higher, at which point it will start to hit the stock market. But there's one development, one very dramatic development, which has potential to turn my narrative on its head. Because what's been very interesting, we've had this announcement that Elon Musk is going to enter the administration, and Elon Musk has said he wants to cut $2 trillion of spending from the federal government. I and mean, that is an enormous amount. If he actually did cut $2 trillion from federal spending from the, from the federal government, that would actually be very Treasury bond bullish. It would be very do U.S. dollar bullish, but it would deliver a deflationary shock to the U.S. economy, which in the first instance would be very stock market negative, although the long-term outcome would be very positive. But the question is, is Elon Musk really going to be allowed to cut $2 trillion from the federal government? That's taking on a lot of vested interests. But if anybody can do it, it's Elon Musk in the Trump administration with the Republican control of Congress. In, uh, in, in your uh, assessment, what's the probability he actually does it? Well, my, no, it's not my base case, but I'm just saying we have to keep an eye on this. <laughs> because we know what we know about Elon okay. Musk. And, and, and you... If, I mean, Elon Musk will, will do it if he's allowed to do it. If he's not allowed to do it, he'll walk out. That would be my base case. But I'm sure there's huge yeah, savings yeah. you can make in the federal government if you really look at the detail. Uh, absolutely. Chris, you know, you, you said that uh, Trump is known to do what he said he will do. Uh, 
And, and one of the things he said is he's going to tariff China in a very large way. Uh, you know, but, but he's got uh, Elon Musk on his, uh, at his side now, right? I mean, and, and uh, China is very important for, uh, for Tesla. And, and you, you think, uh, you know, we'll see very high tariffs against China or this will be different uh, as uh, policies, although though I think he's campaigned on 60% tariffs, etc. But it's going to be much lower, maybe a little even softer as compared to Trump 1.0. Well, I have to say I'm a little bit skeptical of the pressure, uh, from the, that Donald Trump's really going to put 60% tariffs on China. If he does, it's going to increase the cost of goods for many, many Americans. But I believe this is all part of a negotiation tactic. If you listen to what Donald Trump actually says on the tariffs during the presidential campaign, his basic line of argument is that he wants to threaten to raise tariffs to such an extent that uh, overseas companies will be will will be given an overwhelming incentive to move production to the US. So while he will raise tariffs, whether it's 60 percent, I personally doubt. But I think my view is if I'm in Beijing, if I'm the Chinese leadership, I would have opted to have Donald Trump in the White House, not the Democrats, because under the Democrats, policy would have been status quo. And status quo as regards US-China relations is an ongoing deterioration. And the policy which China most dislikes coming out of Washington isn't actually the tariffs. It's this very aggressive policy to seek to deprive China of access to advanced semiconductors. That's what the Chinese really don't like. And so the arrival of Donald Trump does offer an opportunity from a Beijing standpoint to negotiate a new deal with the U.S., and Donald Trump is intrinsically unpredictable in some respects. He's also intrinsically transactional. So I think from a Beijing standpoint, there's an opportunity to negotiate a new deal. And I think China would willingly trade higher tariffs for greater ability to buy U.S. advanced semiconductors. Mm. So, you know, uh, we, we uh, earlier had uh, someone who tracks U.S. and global uh, stuff closely saying that uh, tr the, the way the Trump and Re Republicans have swept uh, the elections, control of the Congress, control of the presidency, uh, you know, it's, it's unprecedented. And it will have profound implications uh, uh, down the line. I mean, over the years, we don't exactly, we can't tell exactly how. But listening to you, Chris, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't look like it's going to be as dramatic. I mean, uh, it, uh, no, yeah, what is your sense? Tra from direction of travel. Yeah. No, I'm talking more from an Indian standpoint. I wouldn't change my investment strategy in India when I owe because Donald Trump's been elected. But it could have dramatic changes in the U.S. I fully agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, now let's uh, let's uh, just sort of wrap, close that part of the conversation, Chris. But just two or three things. Uh, if you if you if you want, if you have numbers in your head. The dollar index, middle of next year, where, should, where, where will it be? S&P 500, no, heard... what's, where will we be? We're at 6,000 now. Uh, and uh, give us a sense on the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield as well. No, no, my, no, my view is firmly that uh, I personally think this dollar strength is short term. My base case on Donald Trump is the dollar strength is short term, but I, I think it can run into the inauguration. Um, my, on the stock market, I think a key issue, which I'm not really the expert on, but it is this issue of, there's this bottom-up issue of the, uh, of the hyperscalers as the market starts to protest at the amount of money they're spending on AI capex. I think the AI capex investment boom continues next year, which is why I still have uh, NVIDIA in my global equity portfolio. But where I've got greatest conviction is that, we're, that the Treasury bond market will be selling off. Um, and that the only way that, in my view, is not going to happen if Elon Musk is really allowed to do this dramatic surgery on the federal government. And if he does, then the stock market in the U.S. becomes very vulnerable. In a world where the Fed, $2 trillion of spending is cut from the federal uh, government, we're going to get a deflationary shock in the in the u.s and that will definitely cause people to invest in equities elsewhere but as i say that it. is not my now let's come to india uh, not for... my uh, absolutely 
Absolutely. Uh, in, here in India, foreigners have uh, been continuous sellers. One of the uh, you know, biggest sell-offs that we've seen, I mean, in the last uh, couple of months or so. Are we, at the e are we near the end of it, risk? What's the sense you get? Yeah, personally, I think we're having a healthy correction in India, which has been led by the small caps, which I think is healthy. We've had, as for, based on the latest data I've seen, we still have these huge domestic flows coming into the Indian market. And what's happened is we've had rising supply of equities because companies have been taking advantage of the high valuations to raise capital. And so we're having a, a natural correction caused by the indigestion of the supply. But I, I, I think it's all really quite healthy. The good news about the foreigners selling is the foreigners have uh, uh, the ability to buy on any sharper correction. But the really interesting point about Indian equity um, this year has been these ongoing domestic flow inflows. No, absolutely. It's been quite remarkable. Uh, although at the margin trace, some are starting to say that maybe demand also is coming off after three, four years, even at the premium end. Uh, you know, consumption is starting to slow down. And it doesn't look like, looking at consumer price inflation numbers in India, that a rate cut is around the corner. I mean, at least not till February of 2025. So, uh, no, you know, yeah, the, at that point the where we... Any... Sorry, go on. Sorry? No, I didn't think the RBI is in any hurry to cut rates. Go, go on, Chris. It, but we have, had a bit of a, we have had a bit of a cyclical slowdown. Last quarter, we had the uh, you know, earnings downgrades. So we do see a bit of a cyclical slowdown in India, but I don't believe it's anything dramatic. I think it's all quite healthy. The RBI had some preemptive tightening last, uh, this year in terms of monitoring banks' loan deposit ratios. So I just think there's been some healthy preemptive action by the Reserve Bank of India in, re in the recent past, which hopefully prolongs the credit cycle.